you're trying to mitigate the damage um, as best you can, then they're they're obviously going to work the claim and pay for it. Yeah. But if you're not doing anything, if you knew, knowingly knew that wildlife was coming in and trampling, <laughs> eating, trampling your crop, and you didn't do anything to try to mitigate that, then you're not going to get paid. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes. But they're not going to be so invasive. <laughs> that if you have, if you have a late freeze or frost, and an adjuster is not going to go in and ask you for. Most likely, he's not going to go in and ask you for all of your records on. Um, so, like pred predator inputs for eating other insects, right? Um, they're not going to go in and ask you on what kind of fertilizers or how much water you put down um, on your on your hemp crop. Okay, they're not going to ask for that stuff most of the time. Oh, um, sorry. There's it, it, some question that I run a nursery, so I get calls from farmers all the time about like these kind of things. And I yeah. try to Okay, yeah, absolutely. That's what I like to hear. <laughs> um, when you say covers reduce yields due to insurable damage, is pollination of a flower, not a seed crop, covered under APA? Have yeah. that discussed at all? Or great, not? great question. So, can you, can you repeat the question too, so everybody can hear it? Right, so she was she was asking about pollination. Is pollination, like cross pollination, covered, right? That's yeah, for a flower producing crop, not a seed. Right, so. And that would be lost. That would be it's a, it's a known reduced. Yes, and so that's something that obviously we've not been asked a thousand times. It's a huge concern, okay? Um, so here's the thing. I know that Justin's shaking his head in the back, um, but he's on the insurance side of it. I mean, so this is something that I've talked to um, the AIPs about. Um, it's one of those things where I think that we could win this if, as long as we can tie it back to a weather event. Okay, so if you had something that was abnormal, so like say high winds, 30, 20 mile an hour gusts, and that's and during that what about week period where there's a flower or pollinating or pollination? Sure. Okay, well I don't know what that is. Yeah, just, okay, Roughly. Needs to happen during maturation. Yes, yes, that is the only way it would be paid. Okay, with the federal policy. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, so, and, and I, can, I can explain our side a little bit too. Uh, basically, the, the reason that we would deny a claim uh, is because of the clause of good farming practices. Mm -hmm. Good farming practices on hemp is that you see a male plant, you need to be ripping that out. If you're growing for CBD or hemp or anything, you got to rip it out. Oh, I'm not saying on your own property. Oh, I'm talking about property. property. I'm talking due to a weather event that was above 20 or whatever miles per hour wind gusts. <laughs> see, it, see, it, see that that it, in that situation, I could see it potentially being. Yes, covered. as your agent, I would take if they weren't going to pay, I would fight tooth and nail for that. As coming from an adjuster background, as an adjuster on other crops, I would have paid on that absolutely. So as your agent, and if they would say no, we would be going to arbitration because it says back to adverse weather, right? Adverse adverse weather. That wind is what caused that pollination to to, to uh, sorry with cross pollination wind on a typical normal day that would not happen. And you can't control what your neighbor's doing. That is correct. Yeah. Great, thank you. Absolute great question. Thank but this is the APH plan. This is the APH. This is the federal policy. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and ensure CBD. So when they say, anytime you hear when they say CBD, we mean oil. Okay. So oil, grain, and fiber. Um, for oil crops, it has to be five acres or more to get the federal policy. Uh, for grain and fiber, it's 20 acres. Um, coverage levels by type, um, that's great because then you can split them out, um, different yields and established yields, um, it's, and, and, and levels, so um, that's, that's another bit too. Okay, so obviously the plan is, like I said, I apologize, you got the wrong map with the wrong counties in there. Um, it, it's, the insurance plan is offered, as of right now, for 2020 crop year, it's offered in 21 states. Um, as you can see down there, um, and then obviously select counties. So here we go. So this is the current map, county map. Okay. Any, any questions? Because <laughs> it makes me want to cry looking at it. Yeah. For state, it's not actually blue yet, or county that's not blue yet. 
um, would it be able to take the information from the states next to it, or is it going to have to wait at least a full year for some yeah. data to approve? Okay. Yeah. Right now. Right now. yeah. No, great question. Um, but remember, we do have private products, we have private policies that can protect you right now, okay? Right now for this growing season, and we will go over this. But I wanted to get through the federal policy first, okay? Um, so we'll get into what it must, it can, it can't, all that kind of good stuff. So the insured cross must have, so an insured, for getting insurance for 2020, um, you would have to have a contract uh, from a processor, um, and it has to be submitted to the AIP, which that's just in the back, by July 31st, okay? Um, vertically integrated producers, so if you're a VIP and you say, well, I don't need contracts, I do everything myself. So a VIP is a vertically integrated producer who does from start to finish, okay? If you are a VIP, you still can qualify the policy. There's just some extra hoops we have to jump through and a little more, a little more documentation, um, but you still would be, um, would still be available for the policy. Are there any VIPs in here? Vertically integrated producers do everything from start to finish? Okay, that's actually the first time there hasn't been at least one. Kind of surprised. Okay, um, we'll keep going. So it must meet regulatory requirements of the governing authority. So that's your state or if you're on tribal ground or, okay. I've grown the hemp crop for at least one year prior to, uh, prior, prior to to be eligible for the insurance coverage. So if you wanted a federal policy for 2020, you've had to have at least grown a crop one other year, 2018, 2019. Uh, must be grown in a field. Um, seedlings are not covered until transplanted. Okay. Insured crops must not be. Does everybody understand the last one here? Okay. There were questions about that before. It's the, the insurance doesn't attach until the transplants or seed are actually planted in the ground of that field location. <coughs> get covered in transit or in a greenhouse. Um, the insured crop must not be interplanted with another crop, planted into established grass or legume, um, planted in a greenhouse or other physical structure, grown on acres where cannabis edible beans, canola, soybeans, or sunflowers were grown in the preceding crop year. That's a big one. And people always ask why that is. Um, I don't know the exact reason, but I have a really good idea. It's just like other crops that have to have certain rotations or there's certain requirements on how long you can have it grown in one year. Obviously there is a, obviously there are concerns for diseases um, in, in soil, they have soil concerns, right? And that's why, obviously, that's why this is out here, why they can be grown in the preceding crop year. Is that total, and does that cover how many years prior? Explain that last So time. it's just, so if, 2000, if 2019 you grew cannabis, edible beans, canola, soybeans, or sunflowers on the ground that you're gonna plant <coughs> in 2020, you cannot have insurance on it, okay? And that's a big negative, I guess, because we probably have quite a few farmers that grew something else and they want to try it out. But the second year, they're fine, as long as the previous year, that's the well, key. Well, I guess that's a question. Do you have a lot of growers that grew cannabis on the ground last year? Okay. That's, <laughs> yeah. Uh, wow. Uh, well, if there are any of the other ones, edible will be canola, soybeans. You know, best practices, USDA best practices are to have a cover crop in between. Right, and that counts as an edible bean, and so that is really unfortunate that they would be actually right. penalizing what the USDA and our CS says as soil best Right, practice. so you know what, actually, that's, that's great, because in the policy language, it says as long as it was terminated before it went to seed, that it, cut, it counts as a cover crop. So where, they, where the crop's terminated, right. then I think that actually, you, we could probably get a, a good ruling on edible on edible bean. If NRCS is saying that that is a good cover crop, yeah, if it qualifies for a good, yeah, if it qualifies as a cover crop, it's NRCS, been terminated before it went to seed. Ter yeah, as long as it, it's terminated before mature maturation of that cover crop. That's um, good information. To get yep, yep, absolutely. All right, and then so double crop hemp is not insurable either. 
Okay, so obviously there are um, there are some guys that are going to be doing like a CBG variety auto flower that has a 40, 42 gray, day growing window, and they're going to double crop it. You can't do that. Okay. Now there are some there are some, and that's a bummer too because it's really a big bummer because with the margins down, I wanted to preach to the, <laughs> to the folks here. Let's start looking into that and uh, and get this auto flower quicker. Yep. quicker yeah, absolutely. And is that something? Is that something that's an issue or concern with you guys? I mean, okay, yeah, that's what we thought, and that's why I have Josh here, um, because yeah, he needs he needs to hear that stuff too. All right. So what we know is that the sales closing date is March fifteenth, um, which we're just going to go through this because obviously a lot of you guys. I mean, this policy is not really going to work real great this year, but I want to stress that it is a really good policy. And that I, that I do believe that it's a policy that's really going to work well. We need you guys to build the data, okay? Um, and once the data is built, I think that this policy is going to cover you guys. It's really going to help with those sleepless nights um, because of the way that it works and the way that it's been proved with its proven track record with other crops against across the country for the last 30 to 40 years, okay? So the final plant dates are June 20th for granite fiber and July 30th for CBD. So really quick, I'll go back. If you are in a county where you grow and so far you qualify and you're interested in the federal policy, you have to have a signed application in by the sales closing date, which is March, March 15th of this year, okay? Um, if you don't, then you're out of policy. We don't have to have acres. We don't have to, we don't have to know really anything else. I mean, there's a few things, but so that's kind of an option, and that's got to, you've got to lock that option. Yep, for the federal policy, there's always going to be a sales closing date, and you have to have a signed application before that sales closing date. So better be a little bit aggressive on that, yep. and then you can always close the option. Yep, right. Yep, absolutely. All right, so acreage reporting date is July 31st for this year, premium billing is September 1st. That's a good one, right? So we actually did, we actually did a policy um, in place March 15th, you're reporting your acres, um, you've planted, and you're reporting your acres, and then your premium is not actually due on September 1st. So you could have actually planted, started growing a good crop, and actually suffered damage before your premium is even due on the policy. No premium is due up front. Go ahead. I want to make sure we uh, uh, kind of look oh, at what Mark was saying. After March 15th, uh, we can't cancel the policy. you got to go through the whole year. Right, so as of, as of March 15th, you can sign up for it, but after March 15th, if you're signed up for it, you don't decide to cancel it. After March 15th, you have that policy through the year, so you're going through the summer, and zero acres, you, yeah. I mean, as So as there as are as ways to get around it. There's ways to get around yeah. it. I just don't want to get people caught up. So there is an admin fee. It's a couple hundred bucks, but you can actually report zero acres. And walk, and basically you're done. Well, yeah. 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 Okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Instead of instead of owing thousands in premium, you know, like what is the admin fee now? Three. It's thirty bucks per uh, per crop. Right. Okay. So, but you can you can close it out. I, if we went, so since Justin's going to bring up, we're just going to go into it. So if that was to happen, and he probably doesn't want to sit here and hear this, but if that was to happen, where Say that we, we sign you up and then you just decide, listen, I don't like this after March 15th, then basically you call me and tell me, I would report zero acres on your acreage report, which is due by um, July 31st, and then they would, the only thing they could charge you is an admin fee. Right, because there's no acres there, which means there's no price there, no contract, they cannot figure out a premium, they can't charge you anything else. And to that, I'm getting, uh, I'm getting into my small business uh, thoughts here, but I'm getting anxious on pricing. Start talking about the dollar of the admin fee. I know pretty soon we're going to uh, use that point. Give me as an example, kind of a rough idea of the cost. Well, we'll go we'll go through it just briefly. Yes. Uh, so uh, coverage levels. So we have coverage levels from 50 to 75 percent, and then cap coverage, which is catastrophic risk, which means that basically it's a 50 percent. You basically have to have a, a a wipeout to get a payment on the policy. Okay. Uh, and insurable types are seed. So here we go, CBD again. Let's just say oil, direct seeded, floor. Okay, so these are the ways that you're going to insure the policy as oil, direct seeded, floral, or oil, direct seeded, whole plant, which that would be a transplant, right? Or sorry, that you're harvesting as a whole plant. Oil, transplant, floral. And then oil transplant whole plant. Then you would 
disinsure it. And if it's fiber, it's just fiber. And if it's brain, you're disinsuring it as brain. Okay, so it does break down insurable types by your direct seeded, by floral or whole plant, or then it has transplant as whole plant or floral. Okay, yes, go ahead. So as you're selecting whichever plant is going to work best for your garden, at which point do you differentiate? I know a lot of the gardens, at least what I've been hearing and seeing lately, have been taking a whole flower plant and then utilizing the stalk as fiber. So would you integrate the two portions in your insurance for that? Or well, what do you mean by garden? Large hemp gardens where they're pulling all of their flower and then they're processing all of the stalk for fiber. So they're utilizing both aspects of the plant to get it. Right. So on something like that, the only thing you really have to determine, and if I'm understanding correctly, is is it direct seeded or transplant? Mm -hmm. And then you would ensure it as a whole. Because right? you're, you're harvesting everything. Yeah. Biomass, right? All of it. Yes. I have a question about the No. One priority. One priority. Yes. Okay. And if it's not a farm consecutive, because it said cannabis, like right? Cannabis and hemp are two different things. Okay, so that was my question. Are you defining cannabis as THC? Yes. Yeah, so any so what they the way they define it in federal policy is is that if it's cannabis, it's anything that was over that point three total THC. No, okay, and say yeah. Yeah. Well, Oregon language is marijuana. But yes, that is, yeah. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. It's kind of a bummer. I mean. No, yeah, well, I mean, there's just so many different terms that are being thrown around now, yeah. and it's uh, always a good idea to make sure that, our, that we're using the common, common yeah. terminology. Well, I don't think there really is a common terminology out there right now, is there? Well, no, we're going to be aware of that. So the federal policy says that it's based off of uh, Delta 9 for determining your TAC level, but then it throws in the language in there that rate your state or tribal supersedes. Okay? So. No, that's not. It's a bummer. Uh, so then we have our types and practices. So you have irrigated, organic, certified. Irrigated organic transitional, irrigated non-organic, then we have non-irrigated, non-irrigated organic certified, non-irrigated organic transitional, and non-irrigated non-organic. So these are always, you're just breaking that down, you're also down, right? So some of the things that aren't available on this APH policy, where they are when an APH policy comes into other crops, is that there is no late planning period. Um, preventive planning is not an option, it's not covered. So if you had rains and you just couldn't get in to plant your crop, um, it's not covered. Or drought works the same way, that's preventive planning.